Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Theodor Weiss. I'm head of patient advocacy and public affairs for Novartis Gene Therapies for Region Europe. And I have my great support and colleague from uh, CRA, Charles River Associates, um, Christopher Jones, uh, who is consulting associate. Uh, he is going to uh, um, give us uh, a broad uh, in, insight of what we developed in the past one year together with SMA Europe and of course with the help of, of CRA. This report is actually was born from a report previously. So if Chris, you could uh, maybe go to the first slide, uh, which was uh, basically, this is the infographic for the whole Europe where you can see um, some diseases and also some countries, you can see the ranking. Uh, from one to 32. So you have all the countries uh, with any kind of diseases that are included in the newborn screening panel. But it differs in a lot of countries, it's different. You can see in Italy, there are more than 48 diseases included in the panel. And Cyprus is unfortunately the last one where only two diseases in uh, equally with Romania, uh, which is also having two diseases at the moment. However, we are very confident that SME is going to be included in the panel uh, very soon. On the left side, you can see the, the map with the colors. Uh, also, the colors are representing uh, according the numbers that I just mentioned before. So green is basically the, the, the countries where we have uh, mostly newborn screening for several diseases on the panel. And of course, the red, which you can see it's uh, quite a lot of countries uh, they are still having um, just a handful of rare diseases. Whoever is not uh, familiar with newborn screening, I would just like to uh, give you some words about newborn screening because we are all coming from different patient advocacy groups uh, at this uh, conference. So newborn screening is one of the most successful public health anti disability and death. Since the first newborn screening, which was started in the uh, 1960s, uh, it was uh, the first test, it was for PKU. Uh, but then other diseases included in newborn screening uh, and it, it expanded also extensively. Uh, before it took uh, 14, 18, 16 years to have a newborn screening, a disease to be uh, included in the panel. However, our experience in the past with SMA that it cannot take so long and it doesn't take so long and it shouldn't take so long. And the reason we would like to give you more insights of the toolkit, it's because we experienced also in some countries where SMA is already included, spinal muscular atrophy is already included in, uh, in the newborn screening panel. In several cases, there were uh, some challenges and um, I would like to give the word now uh, to uh, Chris um, to show you and to talk about those challenges and how we reached uh, the advocacy toolkit, which is actually uh, not only useful for uh, SMA patient advocacy groups, but all other patient advocacy groups who already think that there will be any treatment in the future so that newborn screening could also save lives. So Chris, with that, I give you the floor and I will come back when it's about cost-effectiveness. Okay. Thank Great, thanks for your time. Um, just to check, everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so, yeah, so basically, I think just before we get fully into this, but I, basically what we did was we ran a survey with SMA Europe members, and uh, what we'll show in the first few slides is the results of the survey Can itself. Oh. Um, and then, uh, then after the survey, we then did subsequent interviews with people who responded to the survey to get additional information, some more clarification, and. Um, yeah, a lot more of sort of what happened um, as opposed to the survey, which maybe was a little bit more quantitative. So the two approaches sort of complemented each other and allowed us to have two different parts here. So starting with the survey responses. So 
one of the, the main questions we asked was in terms of how um, involved patient advocacy groups um, actually feel in the process of newborn screening. Um, and one of the main um, responses we had was that in a lot of cases, there are very few countries where they see a clear and formal role for them in newborn screening, uh, the expansion of newborn screening. Um, if only four of the countries who responded actually feeling they do have a formal role. Um, however, we did see that a lot of the patient groups who said that even if they don't have a clear and formal role in newborn screening, they do feel there are processes either in a more formal or an informal manner where they can participate and advocate for newborn screening. Um, and then the next part we asked was, okay, so if you can advocate um, and you feel there is a place where you can advocate, what are some of the key challenges that you had? So these were some of the um, particularly like grouped answers we provided in the survey and we expand on it a bit more on the actual interviews. Um, but these were sort of key themes we had was, although the fact that most of the patient groups felt that there, there is the evidence available to support newborn screening, so whether it's clinical benefit, um, economic benefit, which Theodora will go through later, um, the evidence is available. Um, they just feel that in the, a lot of the time, it's a problem of actually getting involved in the process. So the process itself may be unclear. Um, for newborn screening expansion, which ties in with if there isn't a formal process, which a lot of countries uh, don't have. Then also that a lot of the patient groups, as I'm sure a lot of you all know, um, are not huge in um, organizations. So you have to deal with the resources you have available. Um, and there can be a lot of different competing priorities. So this is one of the key challenges we had as well. Um, which also is even more of a problem if you're lacking support from other stakeholders who could also be valuable in the process of newborn screening expansion. And we have a slide later where we'll talk about who some of those people are. And then what the final challenge to talk about before moving on is actually interact, initiating this initial engagement. Um, and there's something people can find quite challenging if they're not already involved in these sorts of processes is actually getting your foot in the door and finding the initial people to speak to. So these, this is a bit of a mix of the survey and the interview responses. So just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but this is just some of the information we have in this toolkit we've been working on to show just how many people are involved in newborn screening and how this can add a lot of complexity of having all these different people to be involved in. So in a lot of cases, the Ministry of Health is the ultimate decision maker, but there can be lots of branches beneath that. There can be a specific newborn screening committee. There can be a health technology assessment agency. There can be the national health insurance and then also the politicians themselves also see the patient advocacy groups and the physicians as well, whether it's either more on the clinical side or also physicians and scientists who are involved in the, the screening labs themselves. And this is one of the challenges we had is just, there are a lot of different people here and the arguments that you might use or the, the messages you might use to make the case for newborn screening, not all of them are going to have the same impact um, depending on who you're speaking to. And we were only going to go through one of these today, but just for the sake of time, but from the survey and the um, interviews we did when developing our toolkit to support the advocacy for the patient groups, the we came up with these five overall challenge areas. So we're going to go through um, area three in more detail later, but just to go through the others initially. So as I said before, with the lack of a process, um, and if even if the patient groups do have a clear um, strategy and they have information they want to use, as I said, it can be difficult to find the initial opportunity to engage in advocacy work. Uh, limited capacity, and we've already discussed that. 
the the last two points on the actual more practical issues so with the logistical um, infrastructure and implementation so these are one of the key arguments we've seen in terms of pushing back against newborn screening so this is both a challenge to actually getting newborn screening approved and um, because people are concerned about how these programs will actually work in practice and then also even if newborn screening is approved this is then a next step um, that needs to be overcome for all newborn screening to be successfully implemented across the whole country. And then the final challenge is legal barriers. So obviously this is something where if these are in place, this is a challenge that completely underpins everything else. Um, if there is a law in place, so for example, if there's any ethical laws or any sort of laws against genetic testing, this is something which needs to be resolved um, before any of these other steps can be engaged in. Um, we do have these buttons at the bottom, which uh, provide some additional resources, um, noting a bit more in who some of the uh, key decision makers are across a bunch of different countries. We have a library of case studies of based on examples from patient groups of what they've done, what the challenges they faced were, um, and how, how they responded and what they felt went well or what didn't and links to additional resources as well from multiple different sources. And one of the additional resources we're going to go into, which Theodora is going to take over, is on cost effectiveness. So we're just providing some initial information here, which Theodora is going to go through in a bit more detail. Thank you. So I just mentioned before that cost effectiveness is, uh, is very important when we are talking about um, newborn screening. If I'm talking about spinal muscular atrophy, um, earlier treatment increases patient chances for a normal motor milestone development, such as sitting, standing, or walking. When patients achieve additional or higher motor milestones, their lifetime health outcomes are improved and healthcare costs are reduced. And that's the reason why cost effectiveness is so important for us. So, um, Cost-effectiveness study is basically comparing uh, two groups. One, groups. one group is patients with diagnostics by symptoms. Only patients who are having symptoms are tested. And all patients who have the symptoms, they are treated. That's one group. The other group would be all newborns that are screened. And treatment is then usually prior to clinically apparent symptoms is already given. So we are basically uh, in the newborn screening comparing diagnosis by symptoms and di diagnosis by newborn screening. And this is very important to mention. In our newborn screening study, uh, it's a Markov model, uh, quite a complex model. So I don't want to go into details of the model, uh, but it's basically. Uh, showing to the payers to invest in newborn screening because newborn screening versus not screening at birth is cost efficient, is, is cost effective for the, for the government. Uh, which also means that we have been doing newborn screening calculated uh, measures in uh, several countries like Portugal, Ireland, we have for Japan, we have for the UK. We have also actually had five posters at the SMA Europe conference, and we ongoing gave newborn screening cost effectiveness model presentations during also Chris gave uh, this, this presentation, which is actually showing specifically calculated country by country that newborn screening is effective, it's cost efficient. Uh, it's saving the every taxpayer uh, money. We also have um, a Professor Laurent Survey. I don't know if you, you know him, but he was also giving a very great uh, lecture. He has also a YouTube channel, uh, which I'm happy to share with you uh, the link where you can listen to his presentation on newborn screening, where he says, no screening on SMA costs four euro per second. So while I'm speaking, it's already costing a lot in terms of newborn screening. 
And we also experienced uh, during our negotiations with payers that uh, the cost effectiveness model is really uh, a high um, motivating decision maker uh, argument uh, for every health authorities. If you could just uh, go to the next slide, please. Should be on. Can you see the one with the poster? Yeah. So the posters. Uh, I I think the poster is the the one with the purple for Portugal. Thank you very much. And then uh, also just to mention that we had uh, several scientific journals uh, publication on cost effectiveness. You can see uh, in Value in Health, which is one of the most prominent journals for payers, and also uh, other journals in different languages. So. Uh, this model is getting a little bit more widespread. Uh, these publications are publicly available. If you have any interest, please let us know because we are more than happy to share with you also the publications on cost effectiveness. I can also uh, share the link of uh, Professor Laurent Survey on his interpretation on the newborn screening in a very easy language. And of course, we are more than happy to share the, the toolkit with you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Please continue. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Theodore. And then back to this. So, as I said, we will be going through the the third theme in this. So, so saying so, even if there is, um, if you do have your arguments prepared, there can be challenges in making these arguments. There can be pushback and. As I said before, different arguments can be more or less valuable um, depending on who you're speaking to. And these are some of the, the key themes that came out in our research and is a lot of the content that has been going into this toolkit. Um, and the, the toolkit in general, so just to quickly talk about the structure. So we have, it starts with this a slide like this here where we have the overall challenges, then we go into what the specific challenges in each of these themes are, and then show proposed strategies or solutions to try and resolve these specific challenges. And as I said before, then we also have the specific case studies linked on the slides, um, noting um, basically where this um, these ideas are coming from. So which patient groups we spoke to and which country and how they faced a similar challenge and what they did to, to try and overcome it. So I said, so with this theme three, so, um, so as I said, so to start off with, we do split the challenges out into something a bit more specific fitting this overall theme. So as I said, when there are multiple different stakeholders involved, it can be quite difficult to, um, know who's best to present the specific information to. So it's quite important to make sure there are a targeted strategy um, on what you're communicating to who. Um, <clears throat> then there can be specific objections from stakeholders, again, depending on their background. It could be more economic, it could be a clinical concern, or it could be something more implementation based. Um, so, so it's important to make sure you do have the uh, responses ready or be able to develop responses quickly to any of these objections any of the stakeholders could have, whether this is a payer, whether it's a Ministry of Health. Um, and then on the, the third challenge we have within this is um, a bit more on the communication side of things, but we've had some interesting responses in terms of how to manage your relationship with the media. So I think as a lot of you all know, the media can be something that is very powerful for advocacy, but we heard a few mixed responses on how the media can work in practice. Um, so just making sure that there, there needs to be a clear decision on how best to engage with that and to make sure it is supporting your, your aims. Um, and then on the right, we're noting if there's any particular countries, more like a type of country where these challenges are more likely to happen. So as I said before, if there are a lot of different stakeholders involved, it becomes more and more challenging. So you might need to tailor your arguments more and more. If there's very limited experience of newborn screening, so as Theodora showed before on that map, there is a lot of variation within Europe. 
Um, if there's very little newborn screening, um, the Ministry of Health may need a lot more education on newborn screening in one country as opposed to another. And then in terms of level of pushback, um, so the greater the the budget, um, well, the great the the issues with budgets are in different countries, the the more likely they are to push back on any additional spending, um, which is where some of these cost effectiveness arguments can come in. So in terms of an overview of some of the solutions we have, so it's quite important to tailor your arguments. So you need to make sure you are understanding what are where, where is your audience coming from? Where are their objections coming from? So making sure you're understanding what their motivations are, um, why are they making the decisions and building your responses around that. So making sure you are incorporating their goals into your arguments. So obviously what does the Minister of Health want? What does certain politicians want? Um, whoever you are talking to, just to try and understand what, how will this also help them to an extent. Then also making sure to collect um, compelling evidence that is most relevant um, to the people you're speaking to um, and making sure to highlight this broad value of newborn screening. So it's a point where it's not necessarily just uh, something that is a benefit for the one disease that might be being advocated for. As we've seen in some countries, there's a lot of cases where multiple diseases get added at the same time, maybe using the same test. So there are broader benefits and then also there's broader health benefits um, throughout the years as if patients get treatment earlier. And then also it provides greater investment into newborn screening so that can help later on as well. So if there's less, there might be some upfront costs but it can be more cost savings down the line. Then also being aware of any potential objections, as I said before, making sure you are prepared for them, trying to anticipate what objections people could come up with. And then also engaging strategically with the media, which I alluded to earlier, but we'll get to that um, on one of the last slides. So in terms of understanding the, the motivations of your audience, so for example, here where we have the Minister of Health may be about to approve a new treatment um, for the, the condition in question. These is particularly when the arguments around how this can be linked to better um, outcomes if a treatment is recently been available or is about to become available. Um, See, so this is something that needs to be caveated in terms of sometimes treatments might have some age restrictions, so this may be less relevant, but this is something that needs to be managed. As I said before, with politicians, um, they, they like to get re-elected. So if there's ways where this can be highlighted in terms of it can show a politician's commitment to public health, um, child welfare, disability support, um, all of these things can be valuable for them. Um, so this is something that can be uh, messaged to basically say that it's helping them as well to a certain extent while also helping you guys. Um, and if there's the case where there's a new government, so also if there's been a coalition formed and they're trying to form the agreement for how to form the government, um, trying to engage with the politicians and civil servants to try and get that newborn screening involved within a government agreement to try and make sure that stays on the agenda for the course of the parliament. And then also for if the there are any laws or commitments to healthcare access, so this can be equity in healthcare or like improvements in standards of healthcare. This is cases where you can tie it back to these commitments they have made um, and showing how newborn screening is relevant to these commitments and so using their own language and their own claims um, against them to hold them to their word. Uh, in terms of data, so this is what I was saying before, in terms of different pieces of data are more relevant to different people. So um, members of parliament, depending on the, the member, um, some of them may not be as technically minded. So this is the case where specific examples from patients and patient testimonies are probably a bit more likely to be effective with them. Um, whereas if you're talking to people from the National Health Insurance um, or the Ministry of Health, this is more likely when 
the clinical trial data, more technical aspects and the cost effectiveness becomes more valuable. Um, and then clinicians as well, when you come more into case studies and best practices for how to incorporate newborn screening into the management of the, the diseases. And then on preparing for pushback. So as I said, this is a case of trying to anticipate um, what sort of objections you could have and trying to plan out potential responses so you can respond either straight away or pretty quickly. Um, so as we've got a few particular examples we've heard here in terms of limited equipment um, and the costs associated with that. So that's what I was saying before about how you can highlight that if this equipment can be used for other tests in future, this is not just a one-time cost for, for SMA, for example. This is a cost that can also be used for other diseases down the line and that there are overall cost savings as we saw with the cost effectiveness. Um, uh, genetic testing being unethical is something we've heard in a few countries. Um, some people tend to confuse where they may be less aware of newborn screening, tend to confuse newborn screening with uh, prenatal screening. So it's a case of making sure people are very clear and they know what newborn screening entails um, and how this is different from prenatal screening and um, basically addressing any misunderstandings or ethical concerns they could have about that. Another one we also heard is if you diagnose earlier, you'll have more patients. We don't have enough doctors, so we can't handle this. Um, but this is also a case of these patients are going to develop the symptoms eventually, like they, they exist. So it's just hiding the problem. So it's, and again, tying it back to this point that if you diagnose earlier, you can have better uh, treatment outcomes potentially, and then ultimately lower the potential um, visits to hospital. So it could actually ease some burden on the healthcare system. And the last slide I have is engaging with the media. So as I said, there's been some cases where they felt that the, the media has been very helpful. So if there's cases where you're struggling to get any engagement with any key decision makers at all, and there is a need for some public pressure to open up um, the door to get to get in to start having these conversations on newborn screening, if there's been anything that's happened in the public recently, which has raised awareness of newborn screening or the disease um, you're interested in, um, this is the case when the media can actually be quite helpful. One of the cases we've had where the media has been seen as a bit less helpful is sometimes there's been a lot of criticism of the healthcare system or politicians and where patient groups have previously had a lot of engagement with them behind the scenes. So in more like informal meetings, they've then found that it's been harder to stay in contact with these people. Um, so it's the case of needing to decide and what your strategy, if you're going to involve the media to maybe try and avoid any direct criticisms of the people who you're going to be working with, because this process can take many years and the media does move on eventually, whereas these people you're going to work with are probably still going to be there. Um, making sure that if you are going to involve the media, that they are receiving accurate information and making sure that um, the campaign keeps going with the correct information. And because as we know, the media can start misrepresenting things, or maybe they just don't necessarily understand the, the scientific or the clinical nuances, just to make sure the journalists who um, are reporting are correctly educated and really reporting on what the key issue is. Um, so I think we're out of time now. So I think as Theodora was saying, we can share this um, when it's available. So I'm expecting it's gonna be published by SMA Europe pretty soon, um, but we do cover all the other broad challenge areas we had before, along with all this other supporting information, which I've referred to throughout. Um, so just check with Theodora if you wanna have any final closing words. Thank you, Chris. Um, very understandable. For me, I have heard this presentation a couple of times. 
projects and I think that might be a little bit complex to you for you for all of you who heard this first time we have a recording of 90 minutes of this session uh, really going through uh, the details examples uh, again we just had today 30 minutes for this uh, very short uh, teaser but again if you would like to have the recording and any other materials that can help in your country um, to go through the implementation process, please reach out to us. I see a couple of colleagues uh, from Romania uh, and um, I know they are already fighting really hard to implement new one screening in the countries. And just my closing word, uh, there is also some other countries like Greece, like Israel, like Ireland, who are already using uh, this great tool. So uh, good examples are already in place. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for SMA Europe and for uh, CRA, for Christopher today to present. And I wish you a great continuation of the event. Thank you.